forlorn faces, a slight smile in the foreground, perhaps desperation and possibly some hope. How can Europe's new policy on migration end the misery for those travelling and offer comfort and reassurance to those offering new homes? This is Roundtable. €10,000 if you accept an adult, but those countries that don't want migrants can effectively pay not to have them. Will EU states be able to weigh up both the financial and the moral costs? Since 2015, more than a million migrants and refugees have arrived at the EU's borders. The recent fires that destroyed the Mariah refugee camp in Greece, a reminder of how urgent the issue is. While Italy and Greece have accused wealthier members of failing to do enough, a number of Central and Eastern European nations have been openly resistant to the idea of taking in a quota of migrants. Under these new EU proposals, member states will either accept asylum seekers or help with logistical support and pay for people to be returned if their asylum claim is rejected. So will this pact rebuild trust between EU member states and help the many people seeking sanctuary? Well, I'm very pleased to say that we can welcome to this round table uh, from Florence in Italy, Andrew Geddes, Professor of Migration Studies and the Director of the Migration Policy Centre at the European University Institute. Andras Laszlo is in Budapest in Hungary, political advisor to the Hungarian Civic Alliance Party, Fidesz, that's the ruling party, and Julian Lehman. uh, He's a migration policy and law expert at the Global Public Policy Institute, and he's in Berlin in Germany. Great to have you all with us. Uh, Julian, let me come to you first of all. You've not been at all flattering about this pact. You say it's watered down compromise. You say it's burying all ambition. What fundamentally do you think is wrong with it? Well, the fundamental thing that is wrong with it is that the most controversial aspect about the whole asylum governance in the EU uh, is, of course, the question of how member states support each other in times of crisis. And the proposal has, you know, no ambition in that regard. In in a sense, you know, the Commission says it has learned from its past errors. But it is not learned from them in a way that means presenting sort of the strongest proposal, but presenting a proposal that it thinks has the least chances of failing in council. So when we had, for instance, in 2015, a proposal that that would still at least consider whether it would be an idea to give some European Union agencies further competences on asylum, uh, this uh, proposal doesn't go as far as that. It doesn't even... Uh, you know, take a step into that direction. It's uh, sort of a a very low common denominator. Uh, The Commission has has thought that it has sounded out what the member states will agree to, but even that is probably going to be controversial. Okay, so let me go to Andras on that one. The Visegrad countries, they are Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, Czechoslovakia, didn't like what they saw in this at all. What do you think needs to be changed? Well, it's very interesting what Julian just said. Uh, Our position is that actually uh, there are still a lot of um, rules which refer to a quota system, which would mean relocation among member states of asylum seekers and illegal migrants. And the main objection of several countries, including the Visegrad countries, has been specifically this point in previous plans. What we see now is that the Commission did, in fact, soften the tone and change the quota system, but a quota still remains a quota. Uh, we would not like to see mandatory quotas in any uh, migration plan. But, but let me get this right. If, if you don't like um, the quota system, you, Hungary, in this case, could say, sorry, we're going to get rid of the illegal asylum seekers. We're going to pass them back to their country of origin. Uh, you would have to foot the bill, but you wouldn't have to have them. No, uh, perhaps not. But the situation is when you actually have to uh, deliver on this. What we see is that it's actually very difficult to return uh, asylum seekers who are not granted asylum by uh, EU member states. 
and how do you return them to their country of origin? If this was not a problem, we wouldn't be having this discussion and there wouldn't be a relocation quota based on uh, returning asylum seekers. Andrew, this is in a sense reducing the migrants to financial figures. If you don't want them, you pay to get rid of them. Is that fair? Uh, no, I don't think well, that's... I, I think if we look at our recent five years of EU history on this, since the crisis, Julian was quite right to point out that there's been a kind of watering down. And I think when there is a, within the pact itself, quite a transactional approach, both with the way that the Commission is trying to deal with the member states and also the way it's trying to deal with the issues. But putting a, a, a price on migrants really doesn't get to the fundamental political issues, either from the perspective of governments who may support or oppose elements of this, or from the perspective of migrants themselves. So I know there are financial amounts being banded about in discussion of the pact, but the issues are much more fundamental. And I don't think it will come down to very crude transactional issues about costs and prices. I think there are more uh, powerful issues at stake. I think we've already heard in, from the previous two contributions what those might be. And yet you suggest that there's not one country that has totally rejected this. And yet listening to what Andres had to say, uh, the Visegrad countries are, are very much against some of the elements of it. Um, will there be any countries that think it's the best thing that they could possibly have got? I don't think anybody, any country is going to see this as the best thing they could possibly get. This, this is, uh, and I think Julian pointed out this kind of looking for some kind of common denominator. And I think the common denominator has been lowered in this particular document. I know that the Commissioner Johansson in the run-up to the publication of the document was saying that it was unlikely that any member states were going to be completely happy with it because there are trade-offs and compromises involved with it. Um, I think one of the things now that's going to be very important is what happens over the next year, the next two years, as the negotiations begin between the member states, the EU institutions, and of course the parliament. And the devil will be in the detail because there are substantial proposals that need to be brought forward, building on existing measures and introducing new measures as well. And uh, I think that's where we're going to see the real test of member state positions, but also in negotiation with the parliament as well, because it is the co-decision maker in these areas. Uh, this quote is it, it for is each one of you to react to. Yeah, no, please do, then I'll come to this. So I, I think what is important to understand is that in the status quo, whenever you have a crisis situation, there is a very lamentable haggling that is going about. Um, who, who is accepting, who is opening ports, um, what happens if a member state says it is overburdened? And it's it's a it's a perpetual crisis, political crisis on asylum. And it's important to understand that there are some actors in the European Union who benefit from that and who have uh, made political um, benefit from that situation. And I don't I don't think who have well, any. Well, be specific. Who? In the status quo. Sorry. Be specific. Tell us which countries. No, I, th I think uh, uh, Hungary is a case in point. Um, I, I, I think uh, the Fidesz has no, has no interest in overcoming the, the status quo because it simply benefits uh, them if voter salience on migration remains high. And voter salience on migration would only remain high if this agenda uh, can sort of continuously stay in the news cycle. And that what is the current system doing, in a sense. OK, Andres, let me come to you um, on this quote. No, I'm just going to read this one out because it, it relates to what we've just been talking about. Uh, Judith Sutherland from Human Rights Watch. Maybe the humanity is in the fine print. The pact is premised on the same deterrence model that's driven EU migration and asylum policy for years now. It's unlikely to work, but very likely to produce more suffering. And Julian is suggesting that this is the approach that Hungary and the other countries that I mentioned is adopting? Uh, I think I have to reject uh, the idea that this is about political gains. Uh, not Hungary or any other member state wanted this migration crisis to happen. No one wanted uh, conflict in Syria or any other part of the world. Uh, we were doing very well. We're coming out of the economic crisis starting 2015-16 very well. No one wanted this migration crisis. That's my first point. Second point is that it would be a much more humane approach if the EU clearly said that we will not let anyone illegally into the territory of the EU. Uh, that's the 
position of the Visegrad countries, by the way. Our position is that migration is not something to be managed, it's something to be stopped, legal migration. I understand that, but how do you go about that unless you put up barbed wire and uh, mined no man's land areas in between, as it was with the Berlin Wall? Well, for example, with a development aid in countries of origin and also in transit countries, cooperating with third countries, both origin and transit countries, there was the idea of setting up setting up European hotspots where uh, migrants would be able to apply for asylum and apply for residence in the EU or a work permit uh, without having to do the dangerous travel uh, to the frontier of the European Union, either crossing by sea or by land, and risk their lives, pay human traffickers, and who knows under what conditions they will reach the European Union. 62% of asylum seekers were rejected by European member states. That means 62% of people who did the dangerous travel to the European Union uh, were finally rejected. Andrew, I want to come to you to ask you about this idea of relocation camps, which, which, which isn't in this, but it is something that Andras has, has brought up. Um, when we saw what happened on Lesbos, the island of Lesbos in Greece with Mariah, um, the camp there, and 13,000 people made homeless if they had a home in the first place in that camp, at all. This would once again be reducing the migrants to the lowest form of citizen. Well, not even a form of citizenship. It's type of well, what we were seeing was a kind of warehousing people who couldn't move on, couldn't go back. It was uh, unsustainable and the human misery it was causing was uh, couldn't be justified. Uh, that was one of the reasons why the pact on Assam was brought forward just a matter of days, but, uh, and, but you know, responding to uh, what was clearly evidence is significant policy failure, where people, people who uh, in the camps, some of whom would have protection needs, uh, should have the right to have those protection needs addressed by the European Union according to international law, international standards. I think that's at the very crux of the European Pact, but, uh, and it's called a pact on migration, but really the, the focus is on borders, irregular migration, and on asylum, on, on very quite particular aspects of this debate. Uh, but can I ask you what, what, in your opinion, is glaringly missing from this pact? Well, not so much missing, but in terms of the priorities. If you read the pact itself and you look at much of a European discussion on migration going back over 20, 30 years, so not just the pact. The pact isn't, they talk about a fresh start, but these themes have been evident in European debate since the 1990s. This isn't necessarily new, and the components that they're talking about now aren't all necessarily new. We can see very powerful common themes, and uh, I think that's one of the things that is is strikingly apparent now in, with the debate about asylum. Can we turn this around just a little bit and talk about the benefits of migration or the, the harm that can come if you don't have enough migrants? Because I think numbers have been falling since the, they peaked a few years ago. Um, this is from the EU Commission itself. Uh, the EU is currently losing the global race for talent. Other OECD countries such as the USA, Canada and Australia are attracting more talent from abroad. The impact of demographic change in Europe report shows that Europe has an ageing and shrinking population and skill shortages that need to be addressed. Uh, Julian, these migrants are needed now, perhaps more than ever. No, absolutely. I think uh, it's, a, it's a totally fair point. Uh, that uh, migration is something that is very normal. It's it's happening all the time, uh, and we have um, a, um, a a a clear demographic issue in a lot of European Union country. I mean, it's something that we don't see so acutely now with Corona um, uh, discussions being being led everywhere, and and the discussions on the economic humps uh, that we will uh, take. But there is going to be a situation of a normal, hopefully, at some point fairly soon in, in, in the future. And I think uh, we will get to get to that point uh, where we where we have to have these discussions again on on the needs of labor force. Absolutely. So then let's throw that one to Andres and say, will there come a time pretty soon when the prevailing opinion in your country and the other ones we mentioned um, in the Visegrad Pact changes totally because the country cannot survive without more immigrants? I'm actually quite surprised at this approach and this question, because this is a completely independent issue. 
legal immigration and whether a country needs more people in their workforce, in their labor market, is one issue. Illegal immigration, irregular immigration, and illegal border crossings are a completely different issue. If in two, after the 2008 economic crisis, we've talked about high youth unemployment in Europe and how there would be a lost generation. Now with the coronavirus, these ideas also came back. Are we losing the second generation of youth in the European Union? I don't see how uh, we should be caring uh, for immigrants, and even if they're skilled and entering legally, uh, and why not care about the talents here in Europe when youth unemployment is still very high? Because we have an aging population in, in Europe and we're not replacing it. Well, there are other means. Hungary, 10 years ago, when the Fidesz government took office, uh, we put forward very strong family policy measures in order to increase childbirth rates. Uh, we saw in many surveys and many research that Hungarians want more children than they finally actually have when they come to that part in their life. Uh, and it seems that uh, our measures are working. We have increased marriages, uh, we have less divorces, and we have more children, so higher fertility uh, than we had 10 years ago. The, the difference, I think, is plus 20% now. So obviously, policy can affect also childbearing. Okay, Andrew, let me come to you. I, I think you have said in the past that it's not migration as such, it's irregular migration that is the problem. Can you expand on that? Well, I think it's two sides of the same coin. So I, I don't think the debates on regular and irregular migration can easily be separated. Just to provide an example of that from the country I currently live in, in Italy, they, there is, there's been quite a strong reliance on irregular migrant labor in some very important sectors of the Italian economy, uh, from provision of food to provision of care for elderly people. So migrants employed both regularly and irregularly become an important component of the Italian labor force. Uh, it raises issues which aren't just about external border control, but also about the way that the economy, the society, the welfare state functions. This has been also an issue in other EU member states too. So what I was trying to say was that the, the European Pact on Migration is, is very focused on issues around irregularity and border crossing. Uh, but I think that regular and irregular migration are actually quite closely linked. I would also say that the channels or pathways for regular migration into the EU have become progressively narrower. Uh, and that is an issue that is addressed, addressed in the European Pact, more towards the end of it, but talking about ways in which pathways for uh, regular migration could be expanded. But I think here one of the key issues is that the number of migrants that are to be admitted is not an EU competence. That's a matter for the member states. And so there are clear constraints on what the EU can do in the area of, of uh, regular migration, of legal migration. Mm. But I, I, I think there are quite important links between irregular and regular migration, and, and, and Italy, I think, demonstrates that. Can we go back to what the EU Commission said about uh, the race for global talent? Uh, unless the system is working perfectly, Andrew, we are going to fall behind those other countries mentioned in this, the, the US, Canada, Australia, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I, 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 I think we've heard this phrase quite a lot, the race for global talent. And I think there is, uh, there is an argument for high skilled migration. And, and if you look at what the kind of public attitudes to migration, we shouldn't just imagine it's a simple binary of for and against. I think the, the public are perfectly able to make distinctions between different kinds of migrants higher skilled, lower skilled, student migrants, family migrants, migrants needing protection. I think people do understand there are different kinds of migration. But I would say that clearly there are arguments for higher skilled migration to sustain and support the European economy. But at the same time, I think there are also arguments for migration to lower skilled employment in sectors such as social care and agriculture. But that does, and I think a point was made earlier, does raise issues about labour markets, how they work, and, and inclusivity in those labour markets for, for employment of, to ensure social inclusion and, and, and uh, as that employment is on, on a fair and equitable basis. Uh, and that can be an issue where irregular migrants are employed in sectors where they're open to abuse, uh, but are also uh, perhaps also undercutting 
uh, through their regularity, wages and conditions in their sectors, which raises important questions about the regulation labour market. So, you know, a global race perhaps is one way of thinking about it, but I think issues are more multifaceted than that. Julian, let me come to you and say, and this is also for Andres as well, but if I could ask Julian first to respond. Um, 2023 is the date at which many of these changes suggested in the pact are likely to be implemented if they are. What other changes do you think might happen in the intervening three years? I, I want to first second um, Andrew uh, and take up the point that uh, the, the pact currently focuses quite a bit on questions of border. Now, I do agree on border management. Now, I do agree that you should not only perceive migration through the lens of irregular migration, uh, but also look at, at the regular forms of migration and labor migration. But I also want to make the, the point here that the EU has been neglecting for years the internal dimension of its asylum system. All the reforms have been on hold, and it's just in the, in the political interest of the EU to finally move ahead so as to avoid a perpetual uh, political crisis on questions of asylum. And if we don't do that to take up your question, uh, what could happen until 2023, I think uh, chances are that uh, in case we get to a new crisis in our neighborhood, in case uh, things go badly in Libya, say, um, it, it will just uh, continue and, and it will just uh, re 2015 will repeat itself. And I don't think that anyone has an interest in that. And, and let, let me ask you this one before I go to Andres. Um, you've suggested that countries such as Hungary could deliberately run down their asylum system and be rewarded. And Andres, you'll have a chance to respond to this. We've got to understand the incentive structure of the current system. If you, in theory, would in a coordinated way run down your asylum system, have asylum seekers migrate onwards, you'd be rewarded under the current system because then eventually there'd be no returns under the Dublin system to your country. And this is this is a, a flaw by design and it, it links to that uh, deterrence logic and it's something that, that, that uh, simply we should uh, do away with. Rewards, Andres, for a system that some people think is unfair? Uh, I don't think... Uh there's any rewards for an unfair system. I think uh, what we need first and, and foremost is to be able to stop illegal immigration on the border. As long as we're not capable of demonstrating that, the European Union is not capable of demonstrating that, the entire debate on legal migration, asylum seekers, and how many numbers should be, you know, the responsibility of which member state are completely pointless. Because if you can't control the external borders, then the influx will be uncontrolled. You won't know, and won't, you won't know, and you won't be able to plan uh, either or, or countries of how many you need in the labor market, what skills you need. It doesn't matter because the people who are going to be coming in is completely random. Andrew, let me come to you and go back to something I mentioned at the beginning of the program, uh, Judith. Sunderland from Human Rights Watch. She says, maybe the humanities in the fine print, this will only lead to more suffering. Is she right? Well, I think that if you read the document itself and it's written very much from the perspective of the political dilemmas confronting EU member states. If you turn around the lens and look at it from the perspective of migrants will be migrants or people in need of protection, yeah, there are serious questions, but I think those question marks are not so much raised by the pact, but also by what we see around us right now uh, in terms of what we, you've, we you already mentioned, the Maria camp, where people are effectively warehoused. There are terrible conditions for people in countries such as Libya, where the breakdown of the political system has led to terrible human rights abuses for migrants, including people in need of protection. So I, I think that that, that you know, certainly, pump, it is essential that the ongoing debate about uh, EU migration and asylum policy has a strong rights-based component, and, and a lot of voices from those who are advocates for rights are arguing it's not strong enough, uh, and all they can, and they can point to incidents over the last four or five years which they they think reinforce that that claim. Will will the argument? ever be about ending suffering, as uh, Judith Sunderland suggests, or will it continue to be about uh, politicization and financial concerns? 
Well, I think what this debate is about, in a certain sense, is, and the Commission has said this, it's written in the document, is trying to normalise the debate about migration, because there has been a high level of politicisation across the EU. The issue has been quite salient in member states, and it's also been a very divisive issue. I think what the Commission is trying to do now, and is talking about doing this, is moving to some kind of post-crisis mode of dealing with these issues and trying in a way to normalise them uh, to, uh, to maybe to, to and, and, and I suppose essentially also give the Commission a footing in these debates because one of the consequences of the 2015 inflows and the political crisis... Is so I'm going to have to stop you, Andrew. I'm terribly sorry. sorry. We are completely out of time. There's so much more to be said, but I appreciate very much the contributions from each one of you. Gentlemen, thank you, and thank you wherever you happen to be watching this edition of Roundtable. Until next time, goodbye.